Okay, hi. My, my name's Mark Seeger. I'm with the Cloud Group. And um, I'd like to talk to you about this tool I wrote called Collectal, which people may or may not have heard me mention a few thousand times before. Real, real quick history. Um, back, in the back in the late 1900s, last century, um, the company I worked for, DEC, was really big in uh, high-performance computing. And everything was based on their True64 uh, operating system. And as Linux started making the scene in HPC, we needed something to deal with for monitoring Linux systems. Back in the True64 world, we used this tool, Collect. And my boss had said, geez, we need something like Collect for Linux. And if you say it really quick, it comes out Collectal. So that's where Collectal came from. So anyhow, what I'd like to talk a little bit about real briefly is, you know, why do you need system monitoring data? And the answer is a little more involved than you might not normally think, because a lot of times people simply say, what's going on in my system right now? And they run top or they'll run netstat or, or iostat trying to figure out what's going on. But sometimes it's like, gee, my system crashed yesterday. What was going on yesterday? And you want some historic data. So you might, if you happen to have SAR running, you might look at some SAR, some SAR output. Um, sometime your system crashed, and you want to know why it crashed. So you want to see, you know what time it crashed, you want to know what was going on right before the crash. Um, sometimes you're trying to tune your system, so you want to make some tuning changes and figure out if your system's performing better or worse. Again, they, there's a lot of overlap here, but you're not necessarily looking at the exact same information in the same way. Again, sometimes you're trying to do benchmarking, which is kind of sort of like performance, but it's a little bit different. And sometimes you're trying to figure out why an application died. And I would argue that you need similar information, but not, almost, but not always the same information. So as it turns out, there's a lot of tools out there now that'll give you this data, which I, I like to think of them as the stat utilities. You know, there's VMstat and NetStat and MPStat and IOStat. And, of course, there's top. And all these tools focus on different things. So, and, of course, there's SAR as well, which does quite a bit. But the thing is, there's also technology-specific tools. For example, if you're running InfiniBand, there really aren't any in InfiniBand utilities that are part of the kernel. There's these InfiniBand utilities like PerfQuery, um, but that's not quite the same thing, so that's yet another tool. And the question is, how many windows do I need to open if I'm trying to monitor you know, three or four different things all at the same time? So just real quickly to talk about SAR, because I like, I like to pick on SAR. SAR is a cool tool, but I, th I would argue that it really does a poor job with system, what I think of as screen real estate. You know, so for example, looking at this, at this screen on the top, if I'm trying to see... What my, what my CPU utilization is, I would argue you really don't need to look at percentage utilization in hundredths of a percent. Again, I'm trying to get the big picture here. If each one of those percentages was only two digits, you could squish the columns a lot shorter and take almost everything and put it in one line. And in fact, that's what I kind of do with Collectal. The data down here is the same as the data up there, and I fit it all in a single line. And there's a little bit more to and collectal, I think. But again, just, just a comment. So I would say that there are challenges in trying to look at all this data because if you're using different tools, they all have different outputs, or a lot of them have different outputs. Some of them log to a file, some don't log to a file. Some have timestamps, some don't have timestamps. And um, again, this makes correlation pretty complicated. Um, Different tools have different levels of granularity. Some tools will actually tell you like individual disk performance. Other tools will tell you the high-level network performance. And, and again, there's the need for both depending on what you're doing. And the question is, what happens then if you want to plot all this data? I know in the case of SAR, there are utilities that will read in SAR data and generate plots, but that's a little clunky. And if you want to plot, say, you know, uh, IOSTAT data, you could take the IOSTAT data, write it to a log file, somehow figure out how to put timestamps on the data, and then you got to run some plot commands and figure out how to get a plot that you want. Again, what I'm looking for is trying to have one tool that lets you do all this kind of stuff fairly simply. 
So some of the things that Collecto tries to do is support multiple formats. And one of the reasons for the multiple formats is, again, depending on what you're trying to do. And you'll, you'll see a little bit of this in a minute. It also allows you to do sub-second monitoring or fractional monitoring. Sometimes looking at your data once a second isn't enough. You might want to look at your data every half second or every quarter second or every tenth of a second. This notion of interactive versus, versus uh, record and playback, that's kind of sort of what you can do with SAR. You can run star and have it print the data on the screen. You can run SAR and it'll save the data in a log file. You can run SAR and play back the data in a log file. All very cool. But then I would argue you're stuck with this, what I call limited screen, inefficient use of screen real estate in SAR that I think makes it kind of hard to look at the data and see what's going on. Plus, SAR doesn't, doesn't support all the different kinds of things that I want to look at. So with Collectal, you can do these kinds of things, and again, you can run it as a service, so you can simply do, you know, a system control start Collectal, and it goes off in the background and starts happily logging data. And it's very lightweight. One of my goals for Collectal was to use on the order of a tenth of a second of CPU, a tenth of a percent of a single CPU, running at 10 second sampling intervals. And it, it does it, which is pretty good considering it's a Perl script. <laughs> The original goal of Collecta was to write it in Perl, debug it, get it to look the way I want, and then port it to C or something. But it ran so well with Perl, I figured there was no, you know, why bother? Plus, by having it in Perl, it was that much quicker to enhance and change. And again, you can read the list yourself. It's, it, it, it supports all the kinds of stuff that SAR supports, NPSTAT, MPSTAT, NFSSTAT, blah, 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 it goes on. There's, there's quite a few different things that it supports. So wait a minute, what's this fractional, you know, fractional interval kind of nonsense? Uh, I did it really because it was cute. I thought it would be fun to do. But there's actually some real times, there's some real times that it's useful. Um, sometimes the changes that you're looking at aren't, they're happening too fast, you can't see them. If you're writing to disk, what's really happening, and most people don't notice this, but if you're going to write a large file to disk, what's really going to happen is, you're really writing to the controller. The controller is caching some of the data, and then as the cache fills up, it has to flush the cache, and the, the, the I.O. has to wait until there's room in the cache to write more data. And you never see this. But if you run collect all like a tenth of a second and you write and you write to a disk, you'll see that the first, you know, the first couple of samples get written much faster. And that's when you're filling the cache. And then as the cache fills, and you get some back pressure, then the I.O. slows down a little bit. The result is you're still going to disk pretty fast, but you can actually see the cache effect, and it can kind of sort of give you an example of, well, how much cache is on my controller? When you have a lot of cache on the controller, you see that, that uh, higher speed I.O. going for a little bit longer than it normally would. Just as a, just as a historical anecdote, in the earlier days of Collectal, we were noticing that when you were monitoring network traffic on a one gigabit link, which meant you could do, eh, give or take, 100 mega, um, 10 megabytes a second, I'm sorry, 100 megabytes a second, you would see, if you were looking at the network traffic, you would see like 100 megabytes, 100 megabytes, 100 megabytes, zero megabytes, 200 megabytes, 100 megabytes, 100 me zero, 200. And, and what was actually happening was we figured out that the, um, the driver was only updating slash proc every second. But when you start dealing with binary, one second turned out to not quite be a second. It was really 0 0.927, 9275 or whatever, 975. And by running collectible in a 975 interval, you actually got rid of that 0, 0200 phenomenon, which was kind of, uh, kind of cute. So my big picture and the intent of this is just to give you an idea of the flexibility that's in Collectal, because what happens is generally Collectal reads its data from slash proc, and then it goes in and it analyzes. Sounds impressive. It subtracts two numbers and divides by the seconds, and that's the answer. But the point is, when you're running in collection mode, it writes it to disk. 
And when you're writing in playback mode, it reads it back from disk. But it always goes through that same data routine. It always goes through the same analyzed data routine. So the result is you can run it in real time or you can play back data and you get the exact same formatted output, which is really a handy concept. Because I know some tools that you run, if you collect the data and play it back, it may look a little bit different than if you run it interactively. And then this thing off to the side is kind of cool too, because if you want, you can report the data in plot format. So instead of formatting it nicely on the screen, it will call a different routine that generates space separated data, which means you can now very easily run it through GNU plot or import it into a spreadsheet or do whatever else you might want to do. There's a couple of basic switches with Collectal. If you look at Collectal, it can be a little... When I first wrote Collectal, and you said Collectal-H, it listed like 50 switches, and nobody wanted to use Collectal. It was way too complicated. So I came up with the notion of, okay, I'm going to have like a half a dozen switches, and that's all I'm going to tell you when, you when you look at Collectal-H. And then there's another option called Collectal-X, which shows extended switches. And now you get all these switches that show up. But the basic switch is really, as you say, I want to look at some data, and, slash, and dash S tells you what kind of data you want to look at. Disk, networks, memory, that sort of thing. I is how often do you want to look at the data for the interval. F says I want to write it to a file. P says I want to play it back to a file. Uppercase P says I want to, I want to look at the data in, um, in plot format. And it's really that simple. So, a couple concepts with Collectal. I talked about multiple formats. There's two main categories of output. Um, summary and detail. And then summary output has two, two cases. What I call brief and verbose. So in brief format, the idea is you always print an absolute minimal amount of information such that you can print everything horizontally in one line. So in this top case, I'm looking at the CPU, disk, and network data in brief format. And what that means is for the CPU, all I'm looking at is the, C is the total CPU time and how much time was spent in the system context switches and interrupts. For the disks, I'm looking at the reads and the writes, both in kilobytes and IOPS. And, and for the network, I'm doing the same kind of thing, except now I'm counting packets in, in, in uh, megabytes a second. When you run in verbose mode, it's like, well, this could take a whole line just to report one type of data. So now when we look at the CPU in verbose mode, we're, we're not just looking at the, uh, total, the total CPU and the system time. We're looking at the, the user, the NICE, the weight, the IRQs, time sent in software interrupts, how much time is sent in steals. And this alone takes up quite a bit of information. Well, while we're at it, there's still a little extra room to put some stuff in. So I list a few more things, including you know, the, uh, the average 1, 5, and 15 minute uh, percentages. In the disk... I've added in a few other things like, um, like the read and write merges, as well as, uh, yeah, I guess that's all I've really added in there. And then for the network data, we've added in additional things like how many multicast packets there were, were there any errors, were there a few other kinds of things. The other thing is detail format, and the whole idea with detail format is these are for types of data that are, that are, that have multi-instances, if you will. So when you look at CPU data, for summary, you're looking at the average CPU load. When you're looking at detailed CPU data, you're looking at each individual CPU. And this is pretty important because the notion is running in summary mode, you're getting a high level view of what's going on. Detail is, okay, I wanna dive a little bit deeper. And, and sometimes what you'll do in playback mode is you play back the data in summary mode and say, geez, this is interesting, what's going on with this CPU, tell me more. And you play it back again in detail mode. And, and again, since Collectal's written the way it is, you can play it back as often as you want, looking at different data. So for CPUs, we get the data in the individual CPUs. Disks, we get the individual disks. Networks, we get the individual networks. And there's a few additional formatting options because I get a little crazy when it comes to trying to be efficient with screen real estate. A lot of times you don't care about time, so why waste you know, eight or 10 columns including the timestamps? But if you want the timestamps, you can either 
get the timestamps, literally hours, minutes, seconds, and that's all you get. Or you might want to include the milliseconds, but you may not always want the milliseconds. There's another option to include the date and time, uh, the, month and, the month and day, if you want to add that as well. And here's what plot format looks like. Extremely ugly, but um, very, very, very pretty if you're GNU plot. A couple of unique features. You can look at process data with Collectal. And, un and, and unlike PS, unless there's a switch in PS I haven't seen lately, but it actually includes the, um, the read and write kilobytes from your block device in your process data, which, is kind of, which can be handy. You can also look at what's going on with your slabs, and you can also, uh, in the case of OpenStack, you can actually look at what's going on with individual VMs that are running on a compute server. I'll go through these real quick. You can look at interrupts by CPU. You can look at summary for the day of what happened with my slabs for a particular slab, what was my minimum and maximum size for a particular process? What time did the process start and end? Some of those kinds of things. Cluster monitoring is, interest, is an interesting thing as well because Collectal doesn't deal with clusters. Collectal only knows about a single node and it writes the data to a file. But it also has the ability to send the data over a socket. So, what you can do in the case of a what you can do in the case of um, in the case collectal, and I'm I guess I'm getting ahead of myself to a different slide, but that's okay. In the in the case of collectal, you can run this tool that says start collectal running on a bunch of machines, send the data back to me, and I can then summarize the data. What this slide is talking about, you can also have it write data to a shared directory. And then by looking in that shared directory, you can play back some of the data from the shared directory and look at multiple machines at the same time. And it, and it also supports writing to ganglia, um, graphite, if, the, if you're so interested in that sort of thing. And one last comment I'll make that I guess I don't want to forget is Collectal has a pretty unique capability that I haven't seen in any other tool, and I guess nobody ever noticed or appreciated it. But you can have collect a log data locally at one interval and send it out over the socket at a different interval. Because a lot of times when you run centralized data collection, you really can't collect your data more than every minute or two. And you lose a lot of fidelity in the data if you're only looking at it every minute or two. But that's the price you pay for centralized data collection. So what you can do with Collectal is you can say, I want you to save samples every five seconds, 10 seconds, whatever. And by the way, every minute or two, send it out upstream over the socket. So your central guy gets the higher level view. And if you need to drill down, you still have the data at the lower level view. Call plot is a little tool that I wrote that just simply front ends GNU plot. So you kind of put, and this, and this, these screens are probably 10 or 15 years old because I haven't, I haven't changed anything. Um, you basically simply say, okay, what directory is my data in? And I'd like to look at memory, NFS, and socket data, and you hit go, and it just simply runs a GNU plot command, points it at your data files, and what it does is it just brings up a couple plots. And in this case, this was a test that I was running where I was, doing, I was doing some tests with a 10 gigabit uh, network card. 10 gig had just come out. And you can see that the date on the file somewhere was uh, 2006. So that's around the time 10 gig started hitting the scene. And again, this was all HPC related and we we're trying to understand what the impact was on HPC clusters. So we uh, were plotting the, um, the impact on the uh, CPU and the context switches and some of that other stuff. Here's another example of running the same stuff, and this time we were running it with a client and a server. And when you look at the data side by side, you can compare the CPU utilization on the top two plots, and you can see that on the client, there was a big load on the CPU. On the server, there was a much lighter load on the CPU. On the client, there... Um, this was looking at the context switches and interrupts, and the bottom one was looking at the disk traffic, which wasn't, wasn't particularly exciting. So this is the tool that I was talking about a little earlier that I got ahead of myself. 
And this is this tool called Colmux that starts multiple instances of Collectal on multiple, machine, multiple machines and sends all the data back. And um, what I thought might be more useful was I'll leave... Are these, are these slide decks going to be made available to people at some point? Be yeah, because my theory is I've tried to include the Collectal commands with the slides so that if you want to go back and say, now, how the hell did he do this? You can look at the slide and it'll show you the switches. Because as I said, there's a boatload of switches in Collectal. Um, but rather than look at some slides on Colmux, a lot of times I think a demo is, is much more useful. So what I wanted to do real quick is hiding in here somewhere. Oh, here it is. So hiding in here somewhere. So here's a quick example. Wait a minute. Go away. I don't want my mail up here. Um, one more try. Okay, so if we look over here, so here's a quick example of just making a liar. Oh, I left off the L. So just here's, you know, here's kind of a quick example of Collecta like I showed you earlier. Oh, no. Can I not do this? Oop. Hang on. Ah, whoa, freaking cool. <laughs> okay, but now I can't see it. Oh, all right, well, that's all right. Let me, let me, we, we can do this. We can do this, all right. Oh, no, wait, maybe we can't. Uh, oh, wow, this is, uh-oh, I can't find my cursor. Maybe we can't do, oh, wait, there it is. Nope, that's, oh. No, I mean, I, I saw the cursor on the bottom somewhere. Oh, there it is. Nope. That's, whoa. Wow, this is, this is kind of, this is kind of tricky. Up. Oh, over there. No. Drag it over. Okay. Whoop. All right. Now, the trick then is not to, not to touch the cursor. So if I control, why can't I control C it? Oh, boy. If this is going to be too complicated, I can... Can I control C it? All right. So, basically, so that's an example of, of just running regular Collectal. If I wanted to show you... Whoops. Yeah. So, like, if I want to look at a subsystem, let's say, network traffic. If I hit return, it will show us the network traffic. What Colmux will do, I have a five node cluster, and in and so I have a five node cluster, and I have this file called XXH, which isn't a very creative name. And in this file, I have the list of the five addresses of the machines in my cluster. And I've run this on as many as 200 machines. So you're going to have to take my word for it that this works. And then I just give it a collectal command. This particular collectal command says, show me my process data. So if I hit return, what we're going to see is the process data on all five clusters sorted by the column of my choice. And in this case, it's PID, which is kind of a useless column. But I can use my arrow keys, and I can change the sort column. All right? And if we kind of go over a little bit, if I want to see, see which processes are taking up the most virtual memory, there they are. If I want to see which uh, processes are taking up the most physical memory, there they are. And depending on what you're looking at, or looking for, this can be extremely useful. And basically, you can run any command that you can run with Collectal as long as it only generates a single line of output. Or in the case of processes, uniform output. So you can't use this command to say, I want to look at CPUs and networks. You can in summary mode, but not in detail mode, because that's a multi-thing multi output. So, as an example, 
one of the commands I find extremely useful in the case of file serving, or I'm sorry, uh, where you have a lot of disks involved. So I'm going to say, I want to look at my disks. And this is a little boring because I don't have that many disks on my VMs. But again, if you close your eyes and make believe, oops, thank you. If you close your eyes and make believe that I had 20 or 30 disks on each machine, you're going to see all the disks on all the machines. And by the way, instead of hitting the arrow keys, you can also type in the column number and jump directly to column 12. And if, in fact, this was actually doing disk traffic, <laughs> I could now sort on my queue size. No, that's not the queue size. That's the read-write size. Here's the queue size. Or, or, the I, or, or the wait times or whatever. And you can actually see on your cluster which are your slowest disks. And in theory, the disks should be kind of sort of similar. And if you find that two or three disks are really slow, maybe it's a bad disk, or, or maybe whatever your I.O. system is doing isn't distributing the load the way you thought. Uh, you know, your mileage may vary. I have no idea of knowing that. But this is a mechanism for looking at... Well, here, well actually, here's one more I can show you, because this I do have bigger numbers. I can run this, and let's look at my CPUs. And this is now going to show me, I hope, this is going to show me 40 CPUs, because these are VMs that have eight CPUs each. And it's sorted by the CPU number, which isn't particularly exciting. And you can also see that the CPUs aren't really doing a whole lot of work, so that's not too exciting either. I could start up a job that will load them, and I was thinking maybe I would do it, but this is taking a little longer, and I'd rather... Well, you know, actually, I think I might have time. If you can bear with me just for a second. Oh, you know, I'm never, I'm never going to... No, th th this is way too complicated with... You know, yeah, let... Now, so now do I have to move my, how do I, I want to get back, I want to get back to my presentation. I got to, right, I'm lost. I'm sorry. Oh, I have to drag the presentation to the right. No. Leave it here and hit F5. Yeah. Oh, hey, you're all right. <laughs> now, now I got to try to figure out where the hell I was. Um, great, thank you. All right, so I have, I have a few things here to talk about the things that I had just shown you. Something that's kind of cool. Something that's kind of cool. This was running Colmux on three monitors that were like five feet wide and I was looking at 200 machines. And this was looking at the CPU load. And the important thing is not that anybody can read these monitors because I sure as hell can't either. But if you take a look, it's very obvious that the, the guys on the left are idle. They're not doing anything. All these guys are busy as hell. Um, oh, here there was a little CPU burst because the uh, CPU load went from like less than 10 to more than 10, so it was an extra digit in the column, and you can see some of the columns are a little wider than the other columns. Over here, you can see, wow, this is kind of weird. Things, things are not steady from the top to the bottom. So again, if you haven't figured out, one of the tricks to looking at data with Collectal is kind of sort of pattern recognition when you're trying to see what your system is doing. The idea is it makes it really easy to spot changes by printing everything on a single line and your eyeball looks vertical and you can see change, which is one of the other reasons why I don't really care for SAR because when you're using it, it's much harder, for me anyway, it's harder to spot change. This is, a, where was it? 
This is another example looking at text output. We're running some tests using uh, Luster. And for those who don't know Luster, it doesn't matter, but it's a parallel file system. And basically what was going on is we had four load clients in a 16-node Luster server. I got that backwards. A four-node Luster server and 16 load clients. And they were doing a bunch of tests. And if you look at the, la the second hat, if you divide the screen down the middle, somewhere there's a line there that separates the, uh, the inputs and the outputs. And what you see is on the left, you see a high load on the clients because they're doing a lot of... I'm sorry, a high load on the servers because the clients are doing a lot of reads. And on the right-hand side, you see, a, you see a lot of writes on the clients, and w whatever it is. But you, you see, you see the, you, you know, when, when, when one guy is writing, the other guy is reading. And that's why some of the columns are zeros and some of the columns have data in them and vice versa. But you can also see from where I've annotated the annotated the, uh, the graphic, you can see sometimes the columns are not consistent vertically, which kind of indicates there's something erratic going on. So that was kind of the intent of that thing. So here's what I was showing you with, with call mucks before, and I don't really need to go through this. So what I want to do for the next couple of minutes is, is go through a couple what I call case studies. And these are real-world examples that I ended up tracking down using Collectal and CallMux and CallPlot and all these different tools. And the, the important thing to remember is there's no recipe. Someone will say to me, okay, I've got a system I'm trying to debug. What do I do? And it's kind of like, well, it kind of depends what you're looking at. So you need to try to figure out what you want to look at and then start looking at it. And troubleshooting is hard. You know, a lot of times, you know, you, you're trying to find a problem and your boss is on your case. Well, what's the answer? What's the answer? Like, I don't know. I don't know. Well, when are you going to know? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I'll know when I know. But, you know, and then eventually you come up with the answer and it's like, oh, change this value from 10 to 20. You spend three weeks telling me to change it from 10 to 20. Well, yeah, <laughs> I mean, this stuff is hard. Um, and sometimes you're, you're not going to find the problems with Collectal. You know, it's one tool in a tool bag. Sometimes you need to use like low-level system profilers that will tell you, you know, this is how I, I mentioned the other day when I was talking about uh, get, put, and Swift. You know, when we found that the Swift client was CPU bound, I didn't find that with Collectal. I found that by running perf and looking at how much time was being spent in what system subroutines. And it's like, oh, it's spending all its time in SSL. So sometimes Collectal can give you some ideas, but sometimes you have to drill down with, you know, with lower level tools. And again, you can't be expected to be an expert on everything. If you're trying to debug a networking problem and you can see some behaviors in Collectal and you're not really sure, but it smells like it might be a network problem, ask, ask somebody who knows more about networks than you do and maybe uh, you'll make a lot more progress together. And I already mentioned the bottom line about sometimes management doesn't want to believe it took so long to solve. So I was at this customer site and they had this uh, Cisco switch that was connected with um, 10 gigabit links. And they, had a, and they had like a 40 megabyte, they had a 40 gigabit uplink. And they were having some performance problems. So I went in with Collect and I started looking at what was going on. And I don't know if people are familiar with this tool, NetPerf. It's kind of a cool uh, network load utility, and you can just say run NetPerf between these two machines, and it'll just, it's almost, it's not really doing a, an F ping, but it's kind of like high level communications back and forth, and you can drive the network to some really high levels of load. So I was running NetPerf between a couple machines, and I was verifying that they could run at speed. Then I was running, then I added a few more machines, and the speed didn't increase. And what I found out, the, Bottom line, any two machines could talk at wire speed. Add more machines, they couldn't talk. The, their performance went down and the wire speed never changed. Got on the phone with Cisco support. They refused to believe what I was telling me. I said, can I talk to your boss? And they escalated it to their manager and I talked to him. And he escalated. And I, I had to go up like three or four levels until people would finally believe me. And finally somebody was willing to log in from Cisco and look around. And 
bottom line is somebody had configured this switch for, um, I think it was like port mirroring or something. And what that meant was all the traffic that was going over the switch was going through this one tag and gigabit port. So no matter how fast you tried running the switch, it was gated by that one 10 gigabit link that was trying to mirror all the other traffic that was going too fast for it to keep up. So it slowed everybody down. So as soon as they changed that, everybody was happy. This was a, va this was a, a fairly fascinating situation. When you're doing remote, um, remote I.O., and this would probably apply to Samba too as well, I would think. If, if you're monitoring the disks on the other end of the connection and you're monitoring the network, the disk traffic and the network traffic usually go hand in glove together. And that's what you're seeing on the left-hand side. We're doing a bunch of sequential I.O. and the network speed and the data speeds were the same. Then we started doing random I.O. and the data rates went into the toilet. Yet the network rates were still really high. And it's, well, this makes absolutely no sense at all. Digging, 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 digging. It turns out that we were doing one megabyte random I.O. And the way Luster works and was configured to try to optimize large file I.O., when you did a one megabyte operation, it would do a 20 megabyte operation to fill the cache so that when you came back to do the next one, the data was in the cache, except you never came back to read the next thing. So as a result, the network was getting hammered with all this luster traffic, yet it was only bringing back a little bit of it. Bottom line, changed it around, disabled read ahead, and everybody was happy. But until you actually started looking at this stuff, you didn't realize what was going on. Now, here's the quiz. Here's looking at what's that, 20, yeah, 20 machines, one of them has a memory leak. Can anybody spot it? <laughs> Sometimes plotting the data can be really, really helpful. And, and that's, that's classic example. This one here was really, this one really had me nervous. We got this customer, again, this was HP. We had this customer, they had like a 200 node cluster and it was running just great. And they got a brand new cluster installed and it was running like crap. And they asked me to go out and help them out. So this was at Harvard University because I was just on the road in Massachusetts. So I go down there and it's like, whoa, this is really crazy. And I'm looking at, and, and we're looking at the machine and if you're monitoring like the InfiniBand traffic, and I don't know how many people are familiar with InfiniBand, it's just another high-speed network. So you can just look at network traffic with Collectal. And they were running this application that just was hammering the InfiniBand. And what you would see was, and I'm making up numbers because I don't remember the exact numbers, but you might see like 200 megabytes a second. And all of a sudden there was a dip. And then it would come back up. And it would run 200 megabytes, 200 megabytes, and then it would be a dip and come back up. And it was kind of sort of random. There would be drops in the InfiniBand. And they had seen this themselves, and they said, HP, your hardware sucks. We don't know what it is, but there's some kind of bug in your InfiniBand. And I'm coming in, and I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, geez, it really does look like there's a problem in the InfiniBand. <laughs> so I start running Collectal on all the different machines, and I'm looking at all the different machines, and sure enough, at a particular instant, all the machines, all the InfiniBands would like stop. And then it would start up again. And they'd run for a while and all the InfiniBand would stop and it would start up again. And it's like, holy crap. And I was like running this with call mucks and stuff so I could look at sorting on the network traffic and, and every single one was losing the InfiniBand. Now this is where it helps. This is where it helps to have a subject matter expert. However, I knew enough about HPC applications, which if you've never really looked at HPC before, it's got this really interesting phenomenon that says many, not all, but many HPC applications do, um, what is it, M MP, MPIO or whatever it's called? And what will happen is one application, you know, if you're like doing a matrix inversion or something, one application will send a copy of the matrix out to everybody and then wait and an answer comes back. Then it'll send out another calculation, and an answer comes back. And it does like thousands of these a second. And that's where all this InfiniBand is getting used. So there's a very peculiar property with um, those kinds of applications. And what happens is, 
if one application, if one system stalls for a little bit, everybody stalls because they're waiting for all the messages to come back and everybody has to wait. So the question is, did one machine have a flaky InfiniBand card and that was causing everybody to slow down at the same time? Or was one of them slowing down causing everybody else to slow down and it had nothing to do with InfiniBand? It's like, oh my God, what's going on? And I'm looking at this for hours and hours and I still can't figure out what's going on. And um, um, I'm just running Collectal, looking at everything that Collectal can possibly show. I'm plotting everything that Collectal can possibly plot, looking for anomalies. And the one thing I spotted was, hey, wait a minute. I'm noticing every time there's a network slowdown, I'm sorry, every time there's an InfiniBand slowdown, one machine is doing a high number of page faults. What's that got to do with anything? I have no idea, but you know, a page fault's a clue anyway. So I'm wondering what, what application is doing all these page faults. Digging, digging, digging. By now we're like four or five hours into the problem. And I notice that the application doing the page faults is Puppet. Oh, okay, I don't know. I have no idea. So I said to the customer, I don't know if this has anything to do with it, but every time the InfiniBand slows down, this puppet, app, puppet application is doing a bunch of uh, page faults. And the customer says, oh, shit. <laughs> when, we installed the new, when we installed the new system, we forgot to point to the correct network for the puppet server. So as a result, Puppet periodically comes up and looks at some stuff. And when it's coming up and looking at some stuff, instead of going to the close network where it'd get an instant response, it was going like, you know, all the way around the corner and back again. And it was a slow, it was a slow process. So he went and he disabled Puppet. And all of a sudden, the network trap, the InfiniBand traffic went away. So it was a real aha moment. And, and it just goes to show that you shouldn't necessarily assume that the system behavior is really where the problem lies. It could be more of a symptom than, than the direct cause. So without, without Collectal and these tools, I, I really don't think it would have been findable in, in less than you know, weeks or months you know, or whatever it was. And as it was, it took like five or six hours. And you could say, geez, if you looked at that first thing, you would have found it right away. <laughs> it's like, yeah, right. So anyhow... That's, that's Collectal and a bunch of tools, and I'm always more than happy, you know, to bend your ear and show you more stuff if you want to see more stuff later. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions anybody might have. I know this is a, this is a lot to get thrown at you, but... <laughs> okay. So again, you know, Collectal is, is available on, on SUSE. Just do a zipper install and, you know, you'll get it. I think the one that's part of SUSE is a few, is a few revs behind. Um, but the functionality really hasn't changed much over the years. Mm. Cool. You know, the one thing that um, one of the guys that I used to work with uh, in my old group who had lots of really good insight, one of the comments he once made was, you know, the problem with all these tools and utilities and whatever, they don't know when they're done. So they keep adding more features and more features and trying to extract more money from their customers and whatever, and it's like, you know, if they just stayed at DOS version 5 or whatever the hell it was, you know, things would have been a hell of a lot simpler. But no, they had to go add Windows users. And, but Collecto, quite honestly, the, um, the functionality hasn't really changed in like, I don't know, 10, 15 years. The only thing I've been doing in terms of support is, you know, a lot of times when a new kernel comes out, they might they might have changed some of the uh, some of the functionality a little bit, or or actually, as I think about it, over the last number of years, I've added support for new disk types or network types or those sorts of things. So the the product the 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 tool itself has been relatively solid, he says in quotes. 
So, okay? Yes, sir. Hello. Ah, ah. very nice. <laughs> so, um, I uh, also worked on like a uh, monitoring tool very, a few about a decade ago, and uh, one problem we had that was t that time was that the the time interval that uh, we set was difficult to really um, uh, ensure. Because I, I would ju just wanted to ask uh, if you have had that too. That's so if, if the system is too busy, the the tool just didn't stay scheduled, and or it, uh, so the interval yeah. is irregular, and you get uh, erratic results. Do you have anything yeah. in in Collectful to avoid as that? As they say, as they say, thank you for a great question, because the way Collectful works is it actually. Um, monitors to the nearest um, to the nearest second to the nearest number of microseconds based on um, how, however accurate the system is reporting the time. So what that means is if you're doing a 10 second monitoring interval Collecta looks at the clock, says, oh, it's five seconds after the minute. I'm going to sleep for five seconds and wake up at 10 seconds after the interval. Then, it, then as soon as it's done monitoring, it says, how long is it till the next interval? Oh, it's 9.72385 9 microseconds. I'm going to sleep for that in length of time. And then I'll wake up and I'll do it again. And it does this calculation every single time it reports its output. And it does this on every single system in the cluster. And what that means is if you were to log in to three machines on the cluster and run Collectal on those three machines in the cluster interactively, you'll see the screens repaint at the exact same time on every machine. And if you have Collectal log timestamps in milliseconds and you look at all the log files on all the machines, all the intervals end in the exact same number of milliseconds on all the machines. When the machine is really super busy, Collectal still manages, I'm still not sure why, <laughs> but Collectal, all, Collectal almost never misses an interval. And I have seen cases where sometimes there's like a three or four or five second gap and there's no data. Virtually every time if I go and I look at the logs and see what Collectal was doing right before that happened, OOM killer is running. And that's such a high priority job, nobody else gets to do anything. And as soon as the OOM killer is done, Collectal restarts and keeps going. But Collectal does, again, in quotes, Collectal does not miss intervals. Collectal runs and collects data at the right time. And there may be very rare cases where it misses an interval, but generally it doesn't. The other thing to keep in mind is a lot of tools out there use a pull model, and they'll have a central guy who pulls them for data. And if the network is slow or some other kind of thing, the data that comes back isn't necessarily the interval of the data that you're looking at. Collectal doesn't mess with networks. It just writes data to a local file, so there's never any network issues involved. That's the other thing, too, that um, I may have had in a slide and forgot to mention it, that there's this big debate about centralized data collection versus localized data collection. And the argument I always use against centralized data collection, if you're trying to debug a complex cluster problem and part of the problem is a bad network, you're never gonna get the data. Whereas if you're collecting it locally, at least you can go and look at what the local machines were doing and have some kind of clue what's going on with the network. So as they say, thank you for your question. I, I hope that answered it. Yeah, good. Anything else? Oh. <laughs> any, any, any other questions? Okay, cool. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for your patience and listening to me ramble. <laughs>